we'll get started. Here we are, week eight, barreling toward the finish line. Hope everybody's uh, getting ready for Thanksgiving, big turkey. Um, a reminder, uh, tonight we are going to be hosting uh, Richard Gingras, who is Vice President of News at Google. He's going to be talking about media trust and the evolution of democracy. That's at 6 o'clock in Packard, so you are all welcome to join us there. We hope you'll come. Sorry about that noise. You'll have to speak over. <laughs> Today our topic is fake news. And we are going to hear from Matthew Jensko, who is professor of economics here at Stanford. Matthew has done extensive research on the 2016 election, the role of the media, and misinformation. It's an area that is ripe for innovation, uh, some might say regulation, and there is a lot to talk about. So let's welcome Matthew. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thanks all for coming. It's great to be here. Um, this is a really exciting audience for me to get to talk to, and I'd love to hear all of your thoughts as we go along. You should feel free to interrupt with questions as we go along. Like, like me talking for an hour and then you asking questions at the end is going to make me feel very nervous because the audiences I usually talk to ask a lot of questions. Um, so do that. I, Anne mentioned fake news. I think. The, the, the way I would uh, sort of frame what I want to talk about today is um, there's a broad set of questions right now about what's happening at the intersection of media and democracy and political polarization in this country. And I want to sort of start thinking about that at a broad level and then kind of zoom in a little more on the role of social media and the internet, and then talk about fake news per se at the very end. Um, and I, I, you know, a couple of other things to say t by way of introduction. One is um, I don't have the answers to any of the questions that we all care about here in this space. Um, I think what, what I'll try to do today is just add some facts to the table that will help at least narrow down the answers and help frame these questions better. Um, and uh, the other thing to say is just th this is in, an incredibly rapidly moving topic, obviously. Uh, what, what is at the center of the public discussion is changing quickly. What information we have is changing quickly. You know, there's a ton of uh, uh, focus lately on specifically the sort of national security dimension of this and the role of misinformation from other countries and the role of Russia in the election. I have zero slides about that, but um, we should talk about it because it's part of this. So I'm, these are sort of, there's some lag here and sort of the speed with which we can do research and figure stuff out, but hopefully the conversation at least we can keep current and talk about whatever happens to be on your mind. Um, so th there is no question that there's a perception out there that we sit at a moment where the depth of divisions between different political sides in this country seem greater than they've been at least at any time in recent memory. And there's a lot of discussion about how changes in technology may be contributing to that. And so for today, I would think about three specific questions. First, to what extent is that first statement actually true, that divisions today are somehow deeper than they have been five years, 10 years, 20 years ago? And can you see that in the data? That's, I think, something that in the popular discussion, most people would say it's obvious that this is true. In the academic literature, there's a tremendous amount of debate about to what extent that is true. And so it is important and helpful to be precise and look at what do we really see in the data. And I think what you end up with is uh, the, your perception that polarization has been going up is correct, but the way in which it's going up is more nuanced and more subtle. And, and understanding that is helpful. Second, to what extent is digital technology, the internet, or social media a driver of that? Is it the internet's fault? And third, zooming in specifically, what was the role of fake news in the 2016 election? And we can also talk there about what was the role of 
things like Russian advertising in the 2016 election. So let's, let's start with trends in, in polarization. Um, so I, the, the, the way you want to think about this is we, we talk about political polarization in the US. Ask yourself, how would you measure that? What data would you go out and look at? What data could you dig up? And what would you do with it to show somebody who is a skeptic who said, yeah, I don't think polarization is going up. What data would you want to look at to try to measure that and to, to document that kind of trend? There's a big literature that does that. And the way to understand that literature is first to kind of partition it into two parts. One part of that literature is about have politicians in this country become more polarized? And the other part of that literature is about have individual voters and citizens in this country become more polarized? And those are different questions, different data. It's possible that the answers are different for the two of them. Um, the first of those, what is happening with politicians, I would say there is a lot more consensus about the answer to that question and a sort of more standard analysis that most people have agreed on. So how would you go measure the polarization in the ideology of politicians, or in particular of Congress? Um, think about different things you could look at. Look at what people say. Look at their campaign platforms. The main data source that people have used and the only data source that we have available over a very long period of time to look at long-term trends is roll call votes. Is how people, how individual members of Congress vote in elections. And there's a standard analysis of those roll call votes due to Poole and Rosenthal, who are very famous political scientists. And the way to picture what they're doing is you have, let's take a given year for, for, to start. In a given year, you have a bunch of Congress people, and you have a bunch of bills. And you see for each congressperson on each bill, did they vote in favor or, or against it? And what you want to do is fit a model that will explain those data that has the following properties. There's some, some space which might have multiple dimensions. Each person has a location in that space. And the yes and no position on each bill has a position in that space. So each bill is characterized by two points in that space. Each person is characterized by one point in that space. And uh, my likelihood of voting yes on a bill is higher the closer I am to the yes position. And the likelihood of voting no is higher the closer I am to the no position. So that's sort of the model you have in mind. You can think about how that's going to work. It's going to end up being very similar to a kind of principal components type decomposition of, of those data. Um, and what you find when you do that is, one, you might have thought that in order to fit those data well, you need 10 dimensions. There's how do people feel about taxes, and how do they feel about abortion, and how do they feel about a bunch of different issues. But it turns out that almost all of the variation is explained by just one dimension. So your fit of the data, if you just use one dimension, is almost as good as if you use many. So you can have one dimension of ideology. And then uh, each person you can locate along that dimension, which turns out basically to be just a left-right party division dimension. So then how do you get from there to polarization? Well, the standard way to conceptualize polarization in that context is what is the distance between the average Republican and the average Democrat? If they're kind of close to each other in that space, we'll say polarization is low. If they're far apart in that space, we'll say polarization is high. And what does that mean intuitively? It means we're going to say polarization is low when there's a lot of crisscrossing in voting. Sometimes I'm voting with the Democrats. Sometimes I'm voting with the Republicans. It's going to be high when there's one block that always votes together and another vote that always block, uh, another block that always votes together. Does that make sense? So this plot is from 1879 to the present, the distance between the average Republican and the average Democrat along that dimension in the House and the Senate. And this is kind of a famous picture that has been much discussed and much studied. What it shows is there is an increasing trend in polarization. That is correct. That trend did not start with the internet. It did not start with cable TV. It started back around the middle of the 20th century. It's been going up pretty steadily ever, ever, ever since. 
And also, polarization used to be even higher in the past, or used to be similarly high in the past. So although we're in a polarized period now, the late 19th and early 20th century was also a very polarized period. Um, and so this is uh, sort of a return to things we saw previously. Um, this is a plot from, from a paper of ours that looks at a different, takes a different way of looking at this. Instead of looking at roll call voting, suppose we look at language. So what we did for this paper, which I'll just kind of sketch in the interest of time, is we take the, you know, the full text of the congressional record, all of the speeches that are ever given in Congress from recent years all the way back to the uh, 1870s. So you have all the speeches given ever in Congress. And basically ask yourself the question, so, and what we want to capture is how different is the language of Democrats and Republicans? How different is the way they use language? To what extent are these things like, we say illegal aliens, you say undocumented workers, we say death tax, you say estate tax. Uh, some people say radical Islamic terrorism and some people don't. To what extent is that a new phenomenon? So what we do with those data is basically say, supposing each year you trained a machine learning algorithm whose job was to try to guess somebody's party on the basis of which words they use. How well could you do? And so we'll say polarization is high if you can predict with high accuracy. Po Please come sit in the chair over here. I can't let people sit on the floor in the doorway. Um, and polarization is low if it's very hard to predict based on people's speech. So a bunch of details I'm not telling you, but this pink line uh, gives you the resulting answer, which looks very different from this picture. And it says, up until basically the 1990s, it was very hard to tell somebody's party from how they spoke. And this is despite the fact that what they say is going to have some, some correlation with you know, their views on issues. But you had relatively small partisan differences in language. And there's been an explosion in partisan differences of language in recent years. So in this paper, we talk a lot about why that might be. Why do you see this huge inflection point here? Hint, it has something to do with Newt Gingrich and the contract with America and the Republican takeover of Congress, which happened in those years. Um, so like a summary for Congress is polarization is going up. On some measures, it's going up to look similar to where it was in the past. And on other measures, like language, it really looks like something is different than it was before. Just to be sure that I understand, are you saying, is it sort of more that like, if you took a jumble of words from somebody's speech in 1970, then it would be difficult to figure out who the person was. Obviously, if you listened to what they said, I imagine it would be a little bit clearer what their political party was. Well, so, so. But this you, means, like, the, the choice of words is starting, starting to divert. So they're not even using the same vocabulary anymore. Yeah, so the, so the way to think about this is what, what the inputs to this model are counts not actually of individual words, but of phrases. Okay. So did, did you say death tax? Did you say radical Islamic terrorism? Things like that. Um, definitely that is in, in the, the way that is common in predictive models in text analysis, throwing away a lot of linguistic structure in doing that. So we're using just those um, counts. And then what it's saying is it is getting much easier to predict somebody's party based on those counts than it was before. It is still, if you listen to somebody for 10 minutes, you can tell their party today and you could tell their party in the past. But if you listen to them for about one minute, you would have in the past been not that much better than chance and today you're up around 70, 80%. That's a way to think about the, the magnitudes. Yeah. I was gonna ask about the scale. Is it much higher? Yeah, so that's, so I didn't tell you. So what do these numbers mean? These numbers are the probability you could guess somebody's party correctly if you heard them say one phrase. And so those numbers are all small, but they're getting bigger. What that translates into is about a minute of speech down here, you know, you've got a 53, 54, 55% chance of guessing right. Up here, after a minute of speech, which is 100 of these phrases or something, you'd be batting 80% or something. Great question. Um, okay, so that's some sort of background on Congress. What about voters, um, and, which is in some ways what we are most concerned about right now in this discussion. So here, what you want to have in mind is there's a big debate in the literature 
and the consensus, I would say, among leading political scientists circa mid-2010, or 2000s, like 2008, 2006, was the idea that American citizens are becoming more polarized is a myth. So Morris Fiorina, who's, who's a fantastic political scientist who was here, wrote a lot about that. A number of other people did. Um, <clears throat> and so they're looking at data and saying, look, we just don't see this evidence of increasing polarization. So the question is, what data are they looking at? And then there are two possibilities that might change the answer. One is the data up to 2006 looks different than the data from 2006 to today. And the other is that there are measures other than the ones they're looking at that show more increase than the measures they looked at. And both of those things turn out to be true. So what, what, are, what variables are they looking at where we don't see evidence of increasing divisions? The biggest one, and the one that ha was the kind of central focus of that, was sort of by analogy to the party in Congress roll calling vote thing. Say, well, if, if that was the way we looked at Congress, a natural way to look at voters is to say, let's measure their positions on a bunch of different issues and ask how far apart different voters are. And do we see something like, take an issue, you know, what should the tax rate, what should the top marginal tax rate be? Do we see a pattern where 20 years ago, many people sort of clustered in the middle of some scale and that's fanned out. So now some people want 75% taxes and some people want no taxes. That would be an example of one way to think about polarization. That is something we don't see in the data. So contrary, and this is something that, that Fiorina and others have really uh, highlighted, contrary to the common perception, Americans' views on most policy issues are pretty unimodal and pretty moderate. Most, if you ask about abortion, if you ask about taxes, if you ask about, on most things, a lot of people are clustered kind of toward the middle. And that hasn't changed too much over time. Now, you have to be a little bit careful because one of the reasons people can cluster toward the middle is they don't know anything about that or they haven't thought about it. And that's, you can get a lot of people kind of giving middle answers because they don't have strong opinions rather than that they strongly believe the middle is the right answer. But, so that's one place you don't see it. Other places you don't see fanning out include self-described ideology. So you might have thought more people describe themselves as very conservative or very liberal today than in the past. That's not true. You might have thought you'd see it in party identification. More people are solidly Republicans or solidly Democrats than in the past. That's not true. Um, and there has been a claim that you see this in residential segregation. So there's a kind of famous book called The Big Sort, which made this assertion that Americans have moved around to sort politically so that you're much less likely to live next to somebody of the opposite party than you were in the past. And for some reasons we can talk about that claim is, is, has been debunked, or at least people have cast, have pointed out a lot of reasons that that evidence doesn't really show that clearly. And it's clearly, what is clearly not true is that people have moved to sort more because just the rate at which people move is not nearly high enough for that to be true. Like not that many people have moved over that period of time. So here are just a couple of examples. So here's ideology. This is the distribution of Americans who say they are very conservative, somewhat conservative, moderate, liberal, very liberal. You see that's been very stable over time. Here is the distribution of party identification. So do you say you're, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you lean Republican, you lean Democrat, or you say you're independent. And if anything, you have the opposite of what we would call polarization where fewer people are identifying solidly with the parties than in the past, although it's a very gradual trend. So um, those are variables where we don't see this evidence. You might stop there and say, ah, polarization is a myth. I think that's not right. And I think, in fact, if we look closely at the data, we can see that the perception people have is mirrored in the data. And where we see it is really important in understanding what's going on. So what are the variables where we do see evidence? I think the last one of these is the most important but let, let me talk about them in order. Um, so the first, which is maybe a little bit of a wonky, subtle kind of thing, although it is not the case that individual policy views have diverged, so the distribution of views on taxes is not more spread out 
dramatically than it was. What has happened is the correlation across issues of people's views and between people's issue views and party has gone up. So it used to be more common than it is today to have somebody who might have conservative views on abortion and relatively progressive views on taxes. That's become less common over time. And it used to be more common to have a Democrat who had fairly conservative views on a bunch of issues or a Republican who had fairly progressive liberal views on a bunch of issues. That's become less common. Second, so that's the first two. Third, the frequency of straight ticket voting, I just vote R, 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 D, 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 has gone up, despite no change in reported party ID. Finally, and I think by far the most important, and this goes to a lot of really seminal work done by Shanto Iyengar, who's here, and others, if you want to see the thing that we all perceive to be going on, forget about policy entirely. Forget about taxes and trade policy and all this stuff. And just ask people, if, you're, if you identify as a lean Republican or a semi-somewhat conservative, what do you think about, how do you feel about Democrats? How do you feel about liberals? Or you ask somebody on this campus, how do you feel these days about conservatives? There you see really dramatic changes over time and evidence of a really profound an important increase in hostility and negative feelings between uh, the two sides. So you can see this in a bunch of different places. One is just um, there's a there's in, in something called the American National Election Study. There's a thermometer question where you're just asked on a scale of zero to one hundred how warmly or coldly do you feel toward people on the other side, and so take the difference between how you feel toward your own party and the other party as a measure of hostility, that actually was fairly constant up until about 2005, 2006, when some of those other papers I cited were looking at it. But since the mid-2000s, it's just gone whoom, like that. An another thing, you know, other places you can see this, ask people to rate how they feel about characteristics of the other party. So this shows people were asked, for people in your own party and people in the opposite party, to what extent do you think they're intelligent? To what extent do you think they're selfish? So blue here is your own party, red is the other party. In 1960, you know, people sort of said, I think our party is like a little bit smarter, but not much. And they would say, we're definitely not selfish, and the other guys are a little bit selfish, but you know, not too much. And today it's just like dramatic difference. We think our own the, the, the people, the only way to explain the behavior of the people in the other party is they must not be smart at all. They must have like very bad ulterior motives and be really dumb. And I, I don't think this just reflects people being mean or nasty or something. I think there's, there's a kind of mutual incomprehension here where you say, I am trying to understand how is it possible that somebody could vote for Donald Trump and go to this rally in Virginia? Or how could it be possible that somebody could hang around with all these liberal professors all the time? And, and the only way I can make sense of that in my mind is people have to both have like an incredibly misconceived view of what's real in the world and also their motives are something very different than my motives or what I think of as like good motives or socially valuable motives. Another way to see this really clearly, this comes from, was pointed out by in, in one of Shanto's papers, I think it's just like an awesome fact, ask people how mad would you be if your son or daughter married somebody from the other party? That's something that in, as of 1960, like, what are you talking about? I wouldn't be mad if my, nobody said that. And as of today, 20, depending on the survey, 20%, 30% of people say, yes, I would be very displeased. And this is higher than the share who would say this about marrying somebody of a different religion, marrying somebody from a different country, marrying somebody of a different race. This is like the, the, the thing that ranks highest on that. Um, so we, we have a, a paper I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, where we look at a bunch of different measures to try to kind of collect together measures of polarization. Um, and we, we kind of went and found what are all of the ones that do show some increasing trend. So these are some examples. This ideological affect score is the one I mentioned based on those thermometer questions. And you can see it sort of flat up to the mid-2000s, and then it goes up 
That's the same thing for how you feel about the other party rather than the other ideology. This is that straight ticket voting which I mentioned has been going up. This is the correlation across issues. So you can see all these things clearly in the data. If you put them all together, you get a plot that looks like this. So this is an index of all of the measures where we could see increasing evidence of increasing polarization. And I think based on those nine measures, that trend is very clear. Now, to what we are going to talk about next, notice that you would not look at this series and see some huge break around the introduction of the internet or the introduction of social media or something that's been going up pretty steadily for a while. So I think that's relevant to thinking about causes. Um, one other thing to mention, by the way, just it's not in the slides, but, but on this stuff, one other thing that um, is a good way to get at this. So how, how many people know what the implicit association test is? But a few people ever heard about, okay. So you should go Google implicit association test and do it. Because it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, I found it to be a really powerful window into my own thinking and my own prejudices. So what it is is basically a test that you do. It's like a test developed by psychologists. And your goal in the task is to sort things very fast. So you have to try to sort things very fast. And typically what you're sorting are some pictures and some words. And you have to match certain pictures to certain kinds of words. So imagine you're doing this about race, for example. You might have black faces and white faces, and you might have words that are positive and negative. And so in one version of the task, your job is to put positive words with white faces and negative words with black faces. You have to do that really, really fast. And in the other version of the task, that's reversed. You have to put the positive words with the black faces and the negative words with the white face. It is an empirical fact that the vast majority of white people are much faster putting good words with white faces than the reverse. That same, I believe that is also true, the reverse is also true for black people. That also is true on a bunch of other uh, categories of people, look at different sexual orientations and so on. Um, Doing it is really powerful because um, I, am, I am faster at putting good words with white faces than bad words with white faces. And you can go into this being like, okay, I, am, I do not want this to be true about me. I'm going to get it right. Try as hard as you can, and you can just feel in your brain, this, it, just, it just doesn't work doing it the other way. Um, so this is obviously a digression, but I, I, I think it's a powerful thing. Related to this, if you ask people to do this with party, put images about Republicans, you know, Republican elephants or you know, red states and things like that with good words versus bad words, the gap is bigger than it is for race. And it's bigger than it is for almost any of the other things that they test uh, on the IAT. Yeah? I think I've seen, I've also taken it and found it to be a very powerful test. Um, but I think I've seen some recent work suggesting that it doesn't necessarily show what people think that it shows. I don't know if you can speak to that. Anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I don't know all of that work, and this is like far outside my domain of expertise. What I would say, just based on my own sense of it, is, is you have to be very careful how you interpret that. And a natural, a kind of common, loose interpretation is, oh, this shows that people are prejudiced, or this shows that people don't like people of the other race. And I, I think what it shows is the, you know, is some very low level kind of processing in the brain related to how frequently you have made these kinds of connections. And so if it is, if it is the fact, if it is a fact that a large share of the times that somebody has encountered black people on, in the media, in their lives, anywhere, are in negative contexts, that's likely to show up as this kind of pattern, even if the person is completely well-meaning and might, when they're not doing super fast judgments but are taking time to slow down and think about it, um, they might not be prejudiced in that way at all. Um, so that's, that, that is one caution about the interpretation. There may be others, yeah. but I think, it's, I think it's interesting to note that this kind of party hostility, that, that kind of low-level automatic processing 
is here for, for party as well in a very dramatic way. OK, so bottom line on polarization. Politicians are clearly becoming more polarized. It is increasingly clear that that is true for voters as well. And if you had to look at one place, I would say focus on the feelings, not on the policies. That sort of describes everything about our politics. Forget about policy and focus on feelings, trust, that kind of stuff. Yeah? Yeah, um, the talk of polarization is often synonymous in America with the decline of America on the global stage. People talk about polarization leading to America's decline. Whether that's true or not, that was interesting that you said at the turn of the 19th century, there was polarization and America went on to have its most prosperous century in our history. And I'm just curious, do you think it's reassuring people look back at that period and say there was polarization then and we still came out of that? Or do you think it's yeah, so, different today and it's actually a crush to be able to look at that and say that we don't have an issue here with the face at all? Yeah, I would say, so one, I would say there is, uh, I would not see good evidence to support the claim that the decline of America on the global stage to the extent that that has happened is caused by polarization. I don't think like the, ti the timing, just the sort of simple timing does not line up um, super well with that. And uh, clearly it's not, clearly our government is not functioning very well, just from a kind of efficiency, like decision making point of view. And clearly that can't be good for us as a country, but the kind of things that if you look at something like, you know, American GDP relative to other countries or American influence or, you know, things like the rise of China and us invading Iraq, like there's a bunch of other things that are not directly linked to polarization that are important. But absolutely the, reminding people that, I mean, even before that plot I showed you, we had a civil war in this country. Right? This was a pretty divided country in 1870. And um, the fact that much of what we see is not as new and as different as people think it is, is super important to remind them. And also, that's sort of why the facts are important also to be clear about you know, what does look like it really is different and what isn't. So people voting in blocks in Congress is not new. People using language in this very strategic kind of systematically different way does look new, at least as far back as, as we can go. Yeah? I guess to that point, are there measures of how people feel about this increased perception of polarization? Like, do people believe that's actually a bad thing? Uh, so I don't, I don't know offhand of any survey that asks people, is increasing polarization in this country a good or a bad thing? But I suspect that a very large majority of people would say it's bad. What is also true is an, an, another version of your question is, how do perceptions of polarization compare to these realities of polarization? And it is, it is definitely true that people's perception of how much polarization there is has gone up even faster. And Another thing that is really important, and this is something that Fiorina has, has emphasized recently, um, part of why those perceptions are so out of, so can, can be so dramatic is people also perceive the other side to be much more extreme on every dimension than they really are. So when you ask people about a conservative, basically like the archetypal conservative in their mind, who they think of as kind of the median conservative, and this is somebody who like reads Breitbart every day and voted for Trump and has these views and wants to get rid of immigration and all this stuff. You think they're the, the median conservative and you've actually got in mind somebody at like the 95th percentile. And the same thing on the opposite side. And that can really, you talk about these like hostility things. If I really thought all conservatives were like the 99th percentile conservative, I would be pretty hostile to them. So I think that's related. Okay, so that's, that's one, setting the stage. What's going on with polarization? Two, this is about media. What can we say about, let's take it as given now that polarization has increased. Question, is that because of digital media? And sort of how much is it because of digital media? Um, I don't have an answer to that, but I'm gonna show you some facts. One useful set of facts to keep in mind is just how important is digital media in the news and information diets of Americans? It's obviously growing over time. And it's going to get bigger and bigger. And the fact that it's going to get bigger and bigger is a reason to care about it. But if we're talking about looking backwards and trying to understand what has happened, what matters is how big has it been up until now. And so a few data points. Note in 2013, these are all, you want to put like big confidence intervals around all these numbers because measuring well, as many of you know, measuring well exactly how many minutes somebody spent using different media is very hard. 
And it quickly runs into just even philosophical issues, like if you were watching TV while looking at something on your smartphone and, you know, and the radio was on in the kitchen, like, what is that? But notwithstanding all that, 2013 McKinsey report, pretty careful as these things go, estimates that all digital media platforms together, including desktops, laptops, phones, tablets, accounted for 8% of total news consumption time. 2016 Pew survey, 18% of Americans said social media was a source they used often <clears throat> for news and information. In the survey in our paper, we get basically the same number. 14% of Americans <clears throat> say that social media was their main source, their most important source of news about the 2016 election. Um, put all that together, it says social media and digital media are important, but they are not the dominant way that people get news and information in this country. This is the breakdown of most important source of 2016 election news. And what you see is it remains the case that the dominant way people get political news and information is television. Cable, network, local TV together account for majority. You then have meaningful but smaller, about 14% online news that is not social media and social media. The fact those two things are equal in size is kind of stunning to me. The fact that now social media is as important as like apps on your phone and everything. But it, it is relatively small as a share of the total. And that's important to keep in mind. Yeah? Um, do you think there could be any discrepancy between um, what people are self-reporting here and what like, the actual impact is? Like you could see there being a lag between people sort of perceiving that TV has been so influential for the last however many decades and and they still view that as more influential than it actually is. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, all of these self-reports you sort of take with a grain of salt. Um, these, self these are like survey self-reports. This is something closer to measure actual minutes. My guess is, if anything, if you could, if you could carefully measure minutes right now, political news and information, TV versus social media, the, the relative the importance of TV relative to social media and digital media would look even bigger than this rather than smaller. Because t you could imagine, even in a world where they're of, of similar importance in influencing people's views, people just spend a lot of time watching TV. That's an activity that takes a lot of time. Most of the time, what people are doing with Facebook is they're opening up, flipping through stuff, looking at it quickly. Um, but, but absolutely, all this stuff, grain of salt. And it may be that. Um, there are various ways in which it understates that. Yeah. Maybe a, a similar line of question around: Does does this account for who actually does vote, or is this just a, a general population level data about news consumption? Yeah, this is the whole population. So, um, if you look at it's a good question. I think if you look at people who vote or people who have high political interest, you're going to have two offsetting forces. One, those tend to be older people. And older people are much more likely to be using TV. We'll talk about that more in a second. The other is, that, that, and that is probably like the, the most important dimension. Smaller than that is there's a kind of income, education, socioeconomic status gradient. And that's probably going to go in the other way a little bit in favor of the digital stuff. I guess is, yeah, I don't, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what it looks like, but my guess is you would have TV similarly important or more important among likely voters. Okay, so that's just overall descriptive statistics. Um, how could we get closer to is social media important in actually driving polarization? Again, I don't have the answer. I, we, we do not have the thing we would like, which is the randomized experiment where some people were randomized to use social media and other people were not. So short of that, uh, what can you do? Well, a really simple descriptive exercise that we do in a recent paper is just to say, um, let's just ask, take, we now have that index of polarization I showed you, right? Nine, based on those nine measures. Let's take that index, let's look at it separately for a bunch of demographic groups, and just ask, are the groups who use social media most intensively the ones whose polarization is going up by a lot? And we embarked on this paper with a kind of hunch. And our hunch was that this was not going to look good for the social media story because of one thing, which is age. 
And if you think that social media is a big driver of, po is like the uh, main driver of polarization, it's almost for sure gotta be the case that you're gonna see that showing up more among younger people than older people. Because people, you know, people over 75 in this country just don't really use Instagram. And, and, and so that seemed like it would be an informative kind of test. Okay, so hunch pretty much confirmed. So this is, do you use social media by age? And it tells you what you already know, which is, I mean, one, it's been increasing over time, and two, young people use social media much more than older people. And this question, this question is like, have you ever used it? Have you ever looked at Facebook? Have you ever, so this kind of, you know, 15% for people over 75, if you looked at people who use it regularly or something, would be even lower. So is it the case, as this might suggest, that polarization has gone up much more among younger people than older people? Polarization measures bounce around a little bit. The answer is no. If anything, it's gone up, gone up by more among the oldest Americans. So people over 75 have seen their polarization increase as much or more. Now, that doesn't mean that social media isn't playing a role. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have an effect. But it says whatever your theory of this is, you've got to have some story for what's going on with the 75-year-olds in this country. And it is not that they are seeing Russian targeted ads on Facebook. Something else. <clears throat> now, that's about polarization. You might say, well, what about electing Donald Trump? That's different than polarization. Maybe it is nevertheless the case that social media was the driving force behind electing Donald Trump. Again, if you had that in mind, you might expect to see Donald Trump did especially well among younger voters. Relative to Republican voting in previous elections, younger voters would have been really pulled toward Donald Trump, older voters less so, and you don't see that either. And so in both of these, you can go do more systematic things and say, take a bunch of demographic characteristics, predict the likelihood of using social media. And on both of these things, polarization and the kind of deviation in votes in the 2016 election goes up the most for the groups least likely to use social media and the internet. Okay. So that's not definitive, but I think it, it, it pushes back a little bit, at least on the view, it's all about Facebook. Um, another set of evidence is about, relates to a specific view of why digital media is related to polarization. So you say, like, why, why should digital media be ca causing polarization, divisions? A leading sort of story for that is, well, it's because online we have a much larger array of sources, including much more extreme sources. That makes it easier for people to self-segregate. And so you have all the conservatives in their own echo chamber where they're just hearing conservative stuff and all the liberals in their own echo chamber where they're only hearing liberal stuff. And um, much of the discussion presumes that that is in fact the case. Interesting question. If you go look at the data, to what extent is it true that what conservatives and liberals see online has been very, very different on digital media? So <clears throat> we, ha we have... I, I unfortunately don't have like the crisp answer to this question for right now. We have a paper um, which looked at data from about eight years ago. So let me show you what it looked like eight years ago, and we can talk about how it's changed. So this is published 2011 data from like 2008, pre-social media. What we do in this paper is ask how ideologically segregated is online news consumption? How does it compare to offline media, and how does it compare to face-to-face -to -face interactions that people have outside? So think about the way we're asking the question. We're sort of thinking of this through a lens of segregation and asking, are you more likely, which of the things following is more likely if you're a liberal? One, that you're on the same digital media site as a conservative. Two, that you're watching the same cable TV program or reading the same newspaper listening to the same radio program as a conservative. Three, that you actually meet a conservative in your family or your workplace or your neighborhood. And that's going to tell us which of these things is kind of a force toward more polarization. Is it right that digital media stands out as creating more segregation ideologically than the other modes of interaction that people have? Um, <clears throat> 
OK, so let me, let me just kind of show you how we're going to measure this and then show the answer. So to measure this, I need to define three things. First, think about a world where everybody's conservative and liberal, and they're choosing different online outlets, for example. The share conservative of a given outlet, say Fox News, is what share of the people who visit it on a given day are conservatives. The conservative exposure of an individual is the average of that across the sites they visit. The isolation index, which is a standard measure of residential segregation, which we apply to this context, is the difference in this between the average conservative and the average liberal. Okay. Just like quick example to make that concrete, think about two sites, New York Times and Fox, 12 conservatives, 12 liberals. Each, conser each of these people is going to visit exactly one site. So think about a few cases. One, all the conservatives go to Fox, all the, conser all the liberals go to New York Times. Then share conservative is one here, is zero here. The conservatives all have conservative exposure, one. Liberals all have zero. And the isolation index, the difference between those is one. So that's the maximal segregation. The opposite extreme would be they split 50-50. Conservative share is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Everybody's exposure is 0.5, and the difference is zero. And then if you had sort of partial, there are more conservatives on Fox, more on New York Times, it'll be somewhere in between. So that's a scale of how segregated people are, basically. What, what, how different is, is the average person on the conservatives' average website and the average person on the liberals' average website? So what does that look like, 2008? It looks like this. Um, here is the internet. So the isolation index I'm plotting on the x-axis. So it's about 0.07. And these give the conservative exposure of conservatives and the conservative exposure of liberals. So this value is the difference between the two. So the average conservative online in 2008 was on a website that was 60% conservative. The average liberal was on a website that was about 53% conservative. So you can think about, is that a big difference? Is it a small difference? Go through a bunch of kind of examples in the paper to think about and argue it's really not a very big difference. It's like a world where the liberals are on CNN and the conservatives are all on USA Today. That's about what this amounts to. How does it compare to other media? It's a bit more than cable TV magazines, a bit less than national newspapers. This is a bit higher because of the New York Times, basically. <clears throat> How does it compare to face-to-face -face interactions? The internet and all media are much less segregated than people's face-to-face -face interactions. So you're much more likely to be with somebody of the opposite party online than you are to actually talk about politics with them, to trust them, to see them in your family, to see them in your neighborhood, and so on. So, so that picture suggests, on the whole, media have been a force against rather than toward ideological segregation. Um, and I can talk about. Why is that true in a sec? Yeah? So it looked to me like almost all of the points were more, especially on the media side, more than 0.5 conservatives. So that just mean, that just mean the average media in this country is very is conservative? No, no. The, way, the, the American population, so here we're using conservative liberal, not Republican Democrat. And there are far more Americans who say they are conservative than who say they are liberal. Liberal has sort of had a somewhat a pejorative reputation in this country. And so you, you have, so the overall population in these data is about 65. Of people who say they're either liberal or conservative, the share saying they're conservative is like 65%. Um, OK, so why don't we see these echo chambers that we expected to see online? There are two reasons. One, circa 2008. Most online consumption, like most offline consumption, is actually highly concentrated in a small share of sites. Most people getting online news were getting it in that period from Yahoo, CNN, ABC News, a bunch of sites who all, whose audiences were all pretty mixed and pretty representative. Yahoo News, people from all over the place, everybody's looking at it. That by itself says you can't have that much segregation. If 60% of people are all getting information from the same sources. You might have still thought that there could be these echo chambers out in the extremes. Maybe 10% of people are only getting news from really liberal sites, 10% from only conservative sites. That also turns out not to be true. Why does it turn out not to be true? Because 
at this point in time, suppose you take the most conservative site in the data, which in this case was something like glenbeck.com. So in the Comscore data, this is all based on Comscore data where they're like directly measuring people's browsing behavior. In the Comscore data, there were basically zero people they could find who were liberals who went to glenbeck.com. So it was like as conservative as it gets. It will pick a random user from glenbeck.com. Who is that person going to be? You can tell two things about them right away. One, they're going to be very heavy internet users. Because people who are not very heavy internet users don't go to glenbeck.com. Two, they're going to be very interested in politics. Because people who are not very interested in politics don't go to glenbeck.com. Those two things together mean despite that being a very conservative site and attracting people with very conservative views, an average user of glenbeck.com is more likely to have read the New York Times yesterday than an average internet news user. And an average user from the most liberal site in the data is more likely to have read Fox News yesterday than the average internet user. So that pattern where the only people who visit the extreme sites are heavy users means even in the tails you don't have much. Okay? So <clears throat> in, in, what that means is a way to summarize this part, in 2008, somebody, imagine somebody who gets all their news from the New York Times. And imagine an, somebody else who gets all their news from foxnews.com. You might have thought of those as that's kind of typical liberal in this country and typical conservative in this country. Turns out that the Fox News person would, be, would have a more conservative news diet than 99% of Americans. And the, and the New York Times person would have a more liberal news diet than 95% of Americans. So if you had in mind those as sort of prototypical what people are doing, that's like way out in the tails. And there are very few people further, somebody who not only, who got half their news from Fox and half their news from Breitbart basically doesn't exist in these data. So that's sort of in some sense an optimistic picture. Remember that it is seven or eight years old. And I think that <clears throat> we might think, and I think there is good evidence to think that this is something that social media does change to a meaningful degree. Just looking at this, we could, we could guess that that might be the case. Looking at this, looking at this. I mean, imagine I showed you this picture and then said, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's take all of people's news consumption and feed it through their social networks, which are over here. What is that going to do? You would expect it's going to lead to a lot more polarization. Second thing is, what happens to these facts on Facebook? They both get totally demolished because Facebook is much less concentrated in big brand name sites because people don't have to like type nytimes.com into their browser. They get directed there by Facebook. And so Facebook like scatters consumption over tons of little sites. And so it is no longer true that if you look at Facebook, within Facebook that somebody who goes to an extreme site must be a heavy user. They could be a heavy news consumer. They could just be like some ordinary person on Facebook whose friend shared the glenbeck.com link and they go. So the theory and the sort of framework we had in this paper also says, gosh, you should be worried about social media. And indeed, if you put Facebook on this graph, Facebook is like out over here. Now, does that mean that the overall picture has changed completely? It means it's it's moved in that direction, but remember that Facebook is still 20% or something of, of, the, of total consumption, or 20% of people say it's their most important site. So recent, you know, circa a couple of years ago at least, Facebook, social media, news consumption mediated through social media was small enough. The overall picture of segregation had not changed that much. I think by 2016, it has more so. But as we look back over the last 10 years or so, most of that time, echo chambers online and in digital media were not really a major force. OK. Um, so there's a couple data points to kind of frame how uh, important is digital media in that overall trend in polarization. Now, go beyond that and say, let's just look at this last election. What do we know about this last election? Um, I'm going to show you a few facts here that come from a paper we wrote. Um, and th the way to think about this paper is we, we wrote it in November and December 2016. This is like totally unheard of for 
academics are certainly unheard of for me. Like usually I decide to write a paper on something and you might see the first version of that paper like two years, three years later, something like that. Um, here we were like, that didn't seem very satisfying in November of 2016. So we said, what could we do fast to try to get some facts on the table? And so this paper is just like a collection of everything we could scramble together in a very short period of time to try to get some data points to kind of look at this. So what we got was we have online audience data similar to what I just showed you. We scraped and pulled together all of the fake news stories we could find from all the fact checking websites, Snopes and so on. PolitiFact. And then we did a survey of our own. We're just going to try to pull these things together. And the main thing that we're going to try to get a sense of is how many people actually saw all this fake news. What was, what was the, if you took an average person in the 2016 election, did they see 10 of these stories, one of these stories, 100 of these stories? And you can think about then scaling that as a share of all of the other stuff that they saw, how much impact might that have had? We haven't done the same exercise for the Russian ads and, and other Russian content that we've talked about, but I think it would be very helpful to kind of do the same thing. Sounds really big when you say $100,000 were spent on Facebook ads by Russia or 120 Americans were exposed to that content, but that's not a very helpful unit in which to put that because it doesn't really tell me how, if, if 126 million people were exposed, how much did each of them see? And how did that compare as a share of all the other stuff they were seeing? And so I'll show that here, that kind of thing here for fake news. It would be really nice to have it for the Russian stuff too. Um, okay, so <clears throat> a few facts that that generates. One, here is just sort of how much fake news stories we could find. Fake news here means stories that were on fact-checking websites that the fact-checking websites said were unambiguously false. The Pope endorsed Donald Trump, Pizza Gate, all this kind of crazy, crazy. This is not like subtle political bias. This is stories that are way out there. Um, in our database, there are about 150 articles total. They were shared about almost 40 million times on Facebook. And they were not all in favor of Trump, but they were pretty heavily tilted toward pro-Trump stories. How many of those stories did people see? We use three different methods to kind of triangulate and all of these methods are very rough, but maybe together they give us some sense. So method one is we know these things were shared 40 million times. Say like we must know something about per time that a story is shared, how many people typically see it. We don't know that for these stories specifically, but you might think that's a number that we know something about. And it turns out it's a number that like marketing studies and other people talk about. Not that many data points, but a few. So if you look at other data points on that, the ratio of reads to shares, people reading something to the number of times it was shared, range maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 15. The upper end of that range is about 20. So you say, suppose, that each of those stories was read 20 times for each time it was shared, that it would imply the average voter saw about three. Yeah? This. If, so the, the bottom line of this is going to be there was not all that much exposure to fake news in our view. So if it's two rather than 20, then that's even more true. If it's 200 rather than 20, then that would kind of point in the other direction. And that's why I'm gonna to try to kind of triangulate a few different things to piece this together. Um, okay, so that would be one way to do it. Second way to do it is, well, we have a list of all the sites on which these stories were hosted, and we know from Comscore some evidence on their traffic. So suppose you just add up the traffic of all of the fake news hosting sites. That would get you about 159 million visits to those sites which is on the order of 1.9 fake news stories per voter. Um, and then method three is based on our survey. And so uh, give you a sketch of how we did this. So basically what we do in the survey is we took a bunch of these fake news stories, sort of handpicked the ones that were most, that were the kind of biggest ones, and then a sample of littler ones. And we also took some other categories of stories. We took true stories, 
had some like big true stories that were things like Hillary Clinton stumbled when getting into a van at the 9-11 ceremony. That was like a big widely reported thing. And then also some kind of smaller true stories. And we just asked people for each story, do you recall hearing or seeing anything about this prior to the election? And if so, is your best guess at that time that you believed it was true? Okay. So do that, you measure, okay, what share of people recall seeing these things? Now there's one problem, which is you could ask people about anything and a substantial share of people will say, yes, I remember seeing that. So we also threw in what we called these placebo stories. These are like fake, fake stories that we made up that nobody saw, but we could say, oh, did you hear the story about how you know, the Trump campaign, one of these was like, did you know that the Trump campaign on the uh, run up to the election was offering to take Democratic voters to the polls, but then like driving them to the wrong place? Something like that. So like, we, we kind of tested these things to make them similar in plausibility to the real fake stories. And, and what you see is a bunch of people recall seeing the real one, see, a bunch of people recall hearing the fake news. But almost as many people recall hearing our fake, fake news. So if you take the difference, it's about 1% of people in the survey could actually remember hearing these stories, and that implies about one fake news story per voter. Okay. So I don't know if it's one, three, five, but it's not 10, it's not 50, it's not 100 of these stories that people were exposed to. Um, so that does not tell you whether this changed the election outcome or not. You have, the, the, we do not have a, an experiment that answers that question. What we can do is give you these numbers and then you can plug in your priors about how plausible is it that these stories had a given impact on people's votes. One thing to keep in mind, most of them were seen by people who were already voting for Trump. And so it can't have changed the votes of people who were already voting for Trump. And then of the people, um, the rest of the people, how much effect do you think it had? We do one kind of calibration exercise. You need to take account of things like, well, the election was decided by only a small number of swing states. The margin in those swing states was less than a percentage point. So it would need to move votes in those states by half a percentage point or to, to one percentage point. Um, as a benchmark, what we do in the paper is think about uh, something we do have measures of is the impact of television campaign ads. So a way to think about this is suppose that one fake news story is like one TV campaign ad. I don't know if it is, no reason to think that it is, but just suppose as a benchmark. Then this would have, the aggregate effect of this on vote shares in the swing states would have been on the order of hundredths of percentage points. Way too little to change anything. In order for it to have changed the election outcome, it would have needed to be on the order of 30 times, 25 times, 35 times, something like that, more persuasive than a TV commercial. So maybe it is. I mean, if you, if you actually thought that Hillary Clinton ran a, se a sex pedophilia child sex ring in a pizza parlor, that probably should change your vote a lot. And so it is not implausible that these things were incredibly powerful. On the other hand, Mo many of the people who saw them in our survey say they didn't believe them. Many people are sharing them because they think they're funny. There's a bunch of other stuff going on. So, um, so that's, that's sort of our best guess to kind of get some calibration of this. And as I say, you can somewhat in your head, it would be great to do it more carefully, think about what, what did these other kinds of content, like the Russian advertisements, imply? How much were they seen? How does that compare? So bottom line, polarization is real. I think digital media are important and are getting more important all the time. So none of this is to say we shouldn't care about them. None of this is to say that we shouldn't care about the fact that Facebook is very different and a world where we all get all of our news through Facebook is a very, very different world than the current world. But that is distinct from digital media are the driving force of what we've seen so far. Um, I guess as, as a final note, you, it's a reasonable question. If digital media is not driving polarization, what is? And I don't, I don't know the answer, but let me offer a few thoughts as sort of speculation. One, if you want to talk about media, I think cable television is by far more important. Um, for one thing, it lines up much better with the demographics. So who watches cable television in this country is overwhelmingly older people. Um, and the timing also of the introduction of 
partisan cable TV, mid to late 90s, lines up much better with the time series pattern. Second, I think we often talk about what's making the voters so polarized and thinking of the politicians as reflecting that. But the opposite can also be true. And I think in something like the 2016 election, the, the causal channel running from what the presidential candidates say to the attitudes and views and feelings of voters is very strong. And so some of this, it may be just the answer is there's stuff happening on the kind of supply side of the political market, which is leading politicians to choose very extreme strategies or leading us to select very extreme politicians and that's feeding back into the voters. And finally, I think most importantly to me is there are deeper things about the diverging experiences of people in different parts of this country and different, different socioeconomic groups in this country that mean their real lived experiences have diverged in a substantial way. Income inequality is part of that. There are other parts of it. The opioid crisis is part of that. Um, and and I, I, think, I think we, it is important at the end of the day not to tell ourselves convenient stories in which everything that is happening is some kind of mistake. But instead to recognize that there are in fact a bunch of people in this country who want Donald Trump to be president. They weren't duped into voting him by Russian spies. They didn't do it by accident because they believed about something about a pizza parlor. They actually wanted him to be president. They continued to support him. There is broad support in this country from a large share of the country for, for that agenda and those policies. And we need to understand what's behind that at a deeper level and not think about it as just an, an offshoot of some technological glitch that happened. OK, thanks. So we have like a couple more minutes. Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts on about what should be done about Facebook. I know like your conclusions, like necessarily fake, fake news might not have a big, like, that big of an impact. But because Facebook can put people in completely different perspectives, even the non, the stuff that you guys said wasn't fake news, but very, like, like Breitbart, yeah. probably didn't put it as fake news, but very highly. Totally. Surprising. So what do you think, like, because of these organizations a certain way, and now Facebook, a tech company, and other tech companies, what do you think the government should do about them, in your opinion? Great. Great questions. Yeah, so first let me just endorse what you said, that I think all of that other content is hugely important. And my takeaway from the fake news stuff is that basically fake news per se is kind of a distraction. It's like a red herring. We shouldn't worry about it. It's like a tiny tip of this much bigger iceberg, and that's the stuff that matters. Um, two, as we were saying, Facebook definitely matters. So what should the government do about that? I, I, I think that. The, the biggest moving piece in that is less what do you think about Facebook than what do you think about the effectiveness of, of, of the government in solving these kinds of problems. And I would have to say I am fairly pessimistic about the ability of the government to directly regulate content in any way. I'm pessimistic both that the government would do a good job of it and I'm also worried about there are a bunch of reasons why historically in our constitution and otherwise we have put brakes on that. And I continue to be, it's all well and good when the government you're talking about is the government you're like regulating all the content. But you have to remember, it's going to sometimes be the government you don't like and you don't want that either. Um, now, I, there are, I think, things, the, the most promising things to me that I've heard on that front fall into the category of things like disclosure regulation for political advertising. I think that, that has its own implementation challenges. How do you decide what's a political ad? It's not easy. But you know, that, I, I would be in favor of Facebook disclosing all advertising. I don't really see ad advertising on TV is public, advertising in magazines is public, all other advertising. Basically, if you run an ad, everybody knows about it. Doesn't seem that bad to say if advertisers are advertising on Facebook, what that ad was, who ran it, should be disclosed. Um, but I think the solution, uh, uh, all of that could help, but I don't think it's going to be the solution. I think the solution is um, largely one way or another is going to rest with the tech companies and with the way that market evolves. I think Facebook actually has, in my view, very good incentives, or at least incentives pointing in the right direction to solve this problem. It is not good for Facebook, what's happened, for their business. They do not want to be known as a place that is half of what you see is false. They do not want to be known as a place that is like subverting American democracy. They've been under a lot of pressure, and that pressure has led them to 
you know, invest significantly in trying to make this better. I also think though that the best world is one in which Facebook is not a dominant platform for news. It wasn't designed for that. The, the pathologies of it are largely related to the fact that it wasn't designed for that. And so like something that's designed for sharing baby pictures is being used for sharing news. When people share news, they're not really sharing information. They're like largely you know, projecting something about their identity and what kind of content we want to like hold up as projection of our identity is very different than, you know, I, nobody shares the front page story in the Wall Street Journal that says the unemployment rate went up, you know, went down by 1%, but that's like important <coughs> information. So, and, and, and it, it seems- sort of leaned into it, like they have the new, like it's one thing when people are yeah. sharing, but then they put the new speed on the government. Yeah, no, no, they have lead, I th so I don't mean to excuse them. I mean, so one possibility is just in, in, the, in the long run, other platforms are going to do a better job of being a place to go for news and, and, and that Facebook is not going to become totally dominant. It is also possible that today, if Mark Zuckerberg could push a button and just say, we're out of the political game entirely, he might very well want to do that. I don't know, maybe not. But it, it's not clear that that component is such a big win for Facebook given all the problems with it. So I. I don't have any strong view on whether we're going to 100% Facebook world, but I think it would help if, if we didn't. Um, I guess like one key takeaway that I've continually seen from the study and other studies is that it's like true that most Americans actually just don't consume that much media. Um, yeah. And when they do, it seems like it doesn't really come from digital media. And I'm wondering if whether there is any way to the sense that like, well, people's views do come from somewhere, whether it's the people around them or if it's the television that they're watching, and whether those gatekeepers of information are feeling an outsized influence from these things that we're hearing so much about, rather than so much the average American. Like, yep, yep. I, th I think it's a very good point, and I don't, I don't have anything other to, to say other than just agreeing. I think people get little media, a lot of their political views such as they are shaped by things like word of mouth, face-to-face -face interactions. That does mean that something that looks small in the data can have a big outsized. If 5% if of people are all reading Breitbart, but they're telling everybody else about it, that could matter. And also, if you're getting very little political information, each bit that you do get can have a big impact on your views. So, and I, I think we're partly looking at media because it's easy to study. Studying all those face-to-face -face things is much harder, but I, I think that's really important. Great, thank you all so much.